Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about torque. On the last video, I mentioned torque uh, many times and, and defined it a little bit, but here we're gonna talk solely about what torque is and how we calculate it. Um, so torque is synonymous with moment of force and moment. So you'll hear any of those three terms, depending on what you're reading and just what terms the author used. Um, so you'll see that like in a variety of um, scientific papers and textbooks and wherever it could be torque, moment of force, or moment, and we're meaning the same thing there. Uh, it's the tendency of an eccentric force to cause angular motion of an object. Uh, so if you recall from the last video, centric force, we're talking about a force going through the center of mass, an eccentric force would be a force that's going off center through the object off of the center of mass. So the torque is the tendency of that force applied off of the center of mass to cause uh, angular motion of the object. Um, we could also say that it's the rate of change of an object's angular momentum, which angular momentum would just be the quantity of angular motion. So it's the rate of change of the amount of angular motion. Um, so torque depends on a few different things. One is the distance of the applied force from the center of gravity. The next is the distance of the force from the axis of rotation. And then finally, how much force is applied. Um, so I mentioned in the last video that torque is not the same thing as force. A lot of people use those terms the same way, but they're not the same thing. Um, so like if we go back to my example of pushing the box on the floor and we're trying to push it forward, if I push the box right in the center, so I apply a centric force, we won't have any torque. There won't be any uh, angular motion of the object. Okay, it's a centric force. If I apply an eccentric force, so I'm pushing on the box with the same amount of force, okay, I'm gonna apply the same amount of force to the box, but now I'm applying it a little bit off center, so it's an eccentric force. Now there will be torque, there will be some amount of angular motion, and how much angular motion there is, or the tendency of my force that I'm applying to cause angular motion is the torque. Okay, so how much torque there is depends on how far away I was from the center of mass in that scenario. Okay, so it depends on three things. How far are we from the center of gravity? Um, how far are we from the axis of rotation? And how much force was being applied? And those things will all affect the amount of torque. All right, so the moment arm is the perpendicular distance between the axis of rotation and the line of action of the applied force. Okay, so in this picture here, what we're seeing is the axis of rotation being the elbow, and then the applied force, in this case, it looks like it's gravity going through the center of mass. So that would be the resistance here. Uh, moment arm of the applied force, we can calculate by multiplying r, so the length of the segment, or from the axis of rotation to whatever point on the segment we're defining as r. Um, and so in this case, it would be the point of application of the force would be the point on the segment that makes our r. Um, and then we're multiplying that by sine of theta, where theta is the angle of the direction of the force relative to the horizontal axis. Okay, so when the elbow is in more or less flexion or extension, theta is changing. So the moment arm of any applied force, whether that be the muscle insertion or um, the weight, you know, the pull of gravity on the limb or whatever the applied force is, theta is going to, as theta changes of that, um, the angle of the joint changes, the theta for each of those forces will change because the um, angle between the force and the horizontal axis is going to keep changing. So that means that as the angle of the joint changes, the moment arms for each of the applied forces will be changing. And so we find those moment arms by multiplying r, so the distance from the axis to where the force is applied, times sine of theta. Okay, so we get a different moment arm when we change theta. So to find the torque that's produced by each of the forces acting, we would multiply the force times the moment arm. 
Okay, so the force times the distance between the axis and the point of the force application times the angle of the direction of the force relative to the horizontal axis. Okay, so it's just force times moment arm is how we find the torque um, that is produced by each of the forces that acts on the system. So when we're defining a positive or negative torque in the body, um, the direction is based on, the direction of the torque depends on which direction that joint is rotating. Okay, so positive torque would be counterclockwise rotation and negative torque would be clockwise rotation. Now it's really hard sometimes to figure out, like if I flex my shoulder, is that clockwise or counterclockwise? It depends which way you look at it, right? Um, so it can be really hard to figure that out, which is why we have the right hand thumb rule. Okay, so the right hand thumb rule is the easy way to figure out um, if a torque is in the positive or negative direction in the body. So what you do is like in the picture, the person is grabbing around the axis of rotation. Okay, so like let's say I am abducting my glenohumeral joint. The axis of rotation is this Z axis that's going in the anterior posterior direction through my shoulder. Okay, so I would grab that axis of rotation, or I'm gonna do it with this arm actually so that I can use my right hand and show you. So you're gonna grab the axis of rotation with your right hand, but which way you grab it depends on which way the motion is occurring. Okay, so if I'm abducting, I'm gonna curl my fingers in the direction of the motion. So abducting would be that way. Adducting, I'm curling my fingers in the direction of the motion going back down. So if I'm abducting, I'm curling my fingers in the direction of the motion around, and I'm holding the axis of rotation, which is the anterior posterior axis in this case. And now my thumb, is pointed in the direction of the positive axis. So we would say that abdu abduction, abduction of the glenohumeral joint is produced by a positive torque. Okay, so that's a positive torque because my thumb is pointed in the positive direction of the Z axis. If I was adducting, I'm curling my fingers this way in the direction of the movement, and I'm still holding on to the anterior posterior axis, but now my thumb is pointed in the posterior direction, that's the negative direction of the Z axis. Okay, so for the X axis, to the right is positive, to the left is negative, and the Y axis, superior is positive, inferior is negative, and Z anterior is positive, posterior is negative. So you're just, you always use the right hand because the left will give you the opposite findings, right? So you're always using your right hand. You find the axis of rotation, wherever it is, and you're wrapping your fingers in the direction that that rotation is curling. And whichever way your thumb is pointing is the positive or negative, okay? All right, so net torque, when we're trying to add up lots of torques that are acting on the same segment. Okay, so none of our forces are ever acting alone. We always have multiple forces acting on the same segments at the same time. And those forces are producing multiple torques um, that are going in often opposing directions. So we have torques going in one direction and other torques going in the opposing direction. And so we need to find the net torque, which is what determines the actual movement that occurs. So we can calculate the net torque of a system um, with these steps. So first, we have to find um, the torques that are produced by each force. So we'll use the equation that we just went over a few minutes ago. So first we need the length of the moment arm, which we calculate by multiplying R, so the distance between the axis and the point of the force application, times sine of theta, the angle um, between the force and the horizontal axis. Okay, so first we find the moment arm. Then we are gonna calculate the moment arm 
times the force of the moment arm. That gives us the torque that is generated by that force. Then we can't stop there. We have to decide if that torque is positive or negative. So we use the right hand thumb rule to figure out if that torque was in the positive direction or in the negative direction. Now that step is critical because if you don't do that and you just assume all of the torques that you're calculating are positive, then your net torque will be totally wrong because all of your torques would have the joint moving in the same direction as opposed, rather than having the torques that are moving you in one way and opposing torques resisting that. So you need to subtract those opposing torques, not add them. Um, so it is critical that you determine for each torque that you're adding together for that segment, you need to know if it's positive or directions, positive or negative direction. So you need to use the right hand thumb rule to figure that out. So you just find the torques for all of the forces that are acting on the segment. So like the torque for each muscle acting on the segment, the torque for uh, the weight of the form. Like in this picture, we would calculate the center of gravity of the form and we would calculate the center of gravity of the book that the person's holding. So those are all, um, we can calculate all of these different torques uh, for every force that is acting on the segment. And we determine which ones are positive and negative and add them all together and we get the net torque for that system. Okay, opposing torque. So just like for all of our other forces, uh, we have equal and opposite forces here. So we have equal and opposite torques that are produced by forces. So for every torque, there is an equal torque opposing it. Uh, but the weird thing, sort of conceptual, and I, this picture is really great for helping you see that, is that at each joint where we have a torque, the opposing torque also causes the same action which is so bizarre, but um, think about it and look at this picture. The paired torques share the same axis of rotation and would cause rotation in opposite directions, but causing rotation in opposite directions of the two different things that are being connected. Okay, so for example, like in this picture, it says the red torque plantar flexes the foot about the ankle, and the blue torque plantar flex is the lower leg about the ankle. So what we're saying is that that little red arrow down at the ankle in the picture, it causes the tibia to stay still and the foot to go down into plantar flexion. Meanwhile, the opposing torque would be the blue arrow, which is going in the opposite direction. It would cause the foot to stay still and the tibia to move in a posterior direction, which is more plantar flexion. So it's like both opposing torques are causing the same action at that joint, but they're causing the same action by moving the opposite bones. So both are causing movement of the joint, the two segments away from each other, but one is causing this to move in that direction and the other is causing this to move in that direction. So they're causing opposite movements of the opposite segments, if that makes sense. But collectively, both torques are contributing to plantar flexion regardless of which segment is actually moving. So because rotational inertia varies depending on the mass and mass distribution of the objects, the angular acceleration that results from the opposing torques is frequently different. Um, so which thing is going to move always will depend on the rotational inertia. It will depend on the mass of the object. So like the foot has way less mass than the rest of the body or than even the, the shank, you know, the distance between the knee and the ankle on um, the foot has way less mass. So the foot is what moves in plantar flexion as opposed to the tibia and fibula. Um, so what, where that movement actually occurs comes down to the rotational inertia. Okay, that's all I have for you. See you in the next video.